Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Our sermon text for our meditation this morning is a portion of the Gospel reading. I'd like to reread a few of the verses. Jesus is speaking here. He says this, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it's completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. This is the word of the Lord, and now, Lord, sanctify us. Make us holy by your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, fellow redeemed, seems like the thunderstorms just keep rolling and the, the lightning strikes are just getting fiercer all the time. Going home from the council meeting this past week uh, at about 8.30, this bolt seemed like it was right beside my van and scared the dickens out of me. I got to tell you, usually the, the lightning discharges to safe places, but, well, the Hadron... Hayden Pass fire is an example of what happens when that lightning hits some of the wilderness areas. And so I got curious and started to look up how many fires occur each year in the U.S. from lightning strikes. And I was astounded. Over 31,000 fires per year starting in the U.S. And we've seen the results of some of those, haven't we? It just decimates forest lands like crazy, and sometimes it's close to populated areas, and, well, homes are engulfed in those fires. Even animals can't get away. And when you look at the aftermath, it's just heart-wrenching to see the, the blackened husks of the homes. People are displaced, and, and even sometimes some of their animals are dead and blackened on the ground. In our gospel today, Jesus tells us, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it is already kindled. You see, Jesus, the true Son of God, knows that judgment day will come to the earth, and he knows what it's going to be like. He wishes that it would all be over because of all the dire consequences that he brings into the world. St. Peter said this and wrote this about God's creation on the last day. He said, The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be burned up. You see, dear friends, Everything remaining in God's creation on Judgment Day will be totally consumed and destroyed. But that fire, that fire has not been kindled yet, although Jesus promised he would return soon. And he definitely wants the anguish to be over soon with his return. You see, he knows on that day that, well, there will be screams and cries of those who are led away by the angels to suffer the fires of eternity and hell. When he spoke these words in our text, he, he knew that the fires of hell awaited him on the lonely cross. And he knows and he grieves because not many will follow him to heaven and faith because his work creates great division between believer and unbeliever. Jesus says and declares in our text this, he says, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it's completed. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, I know Jesus was, was baptized down at the river Jordan by John the Baptist. So what, what is he talking about here? What is this, this baptism that he needs to undergo? 
And I think, I think most of us have, have heard this term before, this phrase, baptism by fire. That term was coined by the English back in 1822 to describe and, and reference a soldier's first experience under the fire, under fire during a, a war. Military boot camps will use all sorts of kind of different methods to, to simulate battlefield conditions to train and, and prepare troops for that shock and awe of what war and battle is all about. And, and yet, those boot camps, well, their efforts can't really fully capture the total horror of what happens in war. Every soldier's very first step into to battle is indeed a, a washing, a baptism, a washing of the senses because the potential for physical death is right there present with them. The baptism that Jesus is talking about here is, is certainly more than the specter of physical death. He knows that the terrors of the cross await him as the horrors of spiritual death will take him. He is distressed, distressed at the very thought that he will hang on a tree to experience baptism by fire. He will experience there hell. Hell, the total separation from the love of God. And why does that baptism on the cross await him? Well, the answer, of course, is always found in Scripture. The answer is found in Galatians. This is what is written. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. You see, Jesus went to the cross to satisfy the curse of man's disobedience to God's holy law. And that consequence, of course, is death. And he hung on the bloody cross to pay for the sins of all of mankind. He suffered the punishment due to you and to me and to for all of the sins of the whole world as he hung there and all of those sins ever committed and that will ever be committed were burned out upon him. You see, dear brothers and sisters, he suffered the fires of hell for you and for me so that we wouldn't have to suffer those fires of hell. And it's your sins, it's my sins that caused him to utter those haunting words from the cross. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, our wanton trampling of God's holy commandments, our trampling just ripped into him as the torments went after his beard spirit. And yet, our Savior is true God. And he is all-powerful. And he met that hellfire right there on the cross. And right there, he defeated it. He defeated sin and all of its death consequence right there. And we know that's certainly most true because he said, it is finished. It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. All that remained for him after that point was to descend into hell and claim his victory. All that was left for him to do was, was rise from the dead on the third day. And those were easy things, easy things for him to do once he had suffered hell for you and for me on the cross. As our omniscient God, Jesus knew 
what laid ahead of him when he spoke these words from our text. Although he knew the horrors that awaited him, he never ever veered from his mission. He never stepped off the path for your salvation and my salvation. Jesus boldly and yet meekly went the way of the cross just for us because he loves you and he loves me so much. His love is so, so deep for all of mankind that in his all-knowing Godhead, he already grieves in this text over those that he knows will be lost to hell forever. And he wants that pain over unbelievers to be gone. He wants it over because he knows that his work on the cross causes great, great division. The Christmas story. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. From his first advent, Jesus announces, God announces, that peace is coming to people in this world. And indeed, the coming of the Christ signaled the execution of, of God's plan of salvation, that plan that was announced so long ago and promised in the Garden of Eden. You see, God would establish peace between fallen mankind and himself through the Savior, the Savior he would bring into the world. And yet, in our text, Jesus says this, Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. And so how can we reconcile this apparent contradiction between the Christmas story and his words of our text? Well, of course, we know the Bible does not ever contradict itself when determining the meaning of a passage or passages of scripture, we must examine the context in which those words were said and written. In the case of our text, we see that Jesus has, he's been teaching. He's been teaching his followers what is expected of them to follow him. For example, he said they would be persecuted, persecuted by the the Pharisees and the rulers, all because of their faith. He has taught them not to store up all of their, their riches without first supporting the church. He's telling his followers, do not worry, especially about tomorrow. He's also telling his followers that they should expect his return at any moment. And then in his, his teachings about what it means to be a follower of the Christ comes our text before us. And he's telling us a very simple but very solid truth. He's saying that following the Savior of the world means that division is going to occur among people. He's not con contradicting the fact that he came into the world to mend the strife between mankind and God. He is stating the fact that not all peoples will believe him as their savior. And indeed, you see, Jesus causes two distinct divisions among people. We often think that divisions occur because of race or, or sex or, or ethnic background, 
that that's the source of division in our world, but there's yet a more fundamental division that Jesus has brought among us, and that division is between believers and unbelievers. You see, it's clearly black and white when it becomes to belief. You either believe or you don't. You either are, are people of God or you're people of Satan. And the only way, of course, to become a child of God and a follower of God is through Jesus. Jesus tells us that, of course, in John, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so Jesus grieves in our text that many will not allow their hearts to be filled with the message of his sacrifice on the cross, that many will not allow their, their hearts to be filled with his perfect life lived in our stead, that many will not allow their hearts to be filled with his resurrection, which is the guarantee of our personal resurrection. He knows that, and he would like to have all that division over and done with so that he can go and live with his followers in heaven forever. Dear brothers and sisters, it is God, our Heavenly Father, who has set the time for Judgment Day. Even Jesus in his humanity did not know that date, but in his humanity and in his Godhead, he did know the purpose for his coming into this world. And it was put to put into motion God's plan to save his highest creation, to save mankind, who he personally, personally breathed life into. Jesus also knew that many would reject him as the savior of the world, even though he would take the route of the cross to shed his blood and to die for all peoples of all times. And he grieves. He grieves over those lost unbelievers, even as he walked in our world during that short period of time. He wishes that the last day would come, and we know it will come. It will come because he has promised that he is coming soon. And so you and I, yes, we pray. We pray for judgment day to come soon so that you and I can cease being strangers living and walking in this sin-filled world and so that you and I can go to our true home, our true home in heaven with Christ Jesus. God grant it so. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding will